Yesterday, I, I gave uh, a talk to a bunch of basically neuroscience researchers, mainly using animal models to study things like addiction. The rest of the audience was people who were deeply embedded in the uh, medical system, in med the medical world, and uh, of course for them, it's the addiction is a disease is pretty much a basic mother's milk. I mean, that's that's the, that's that's the found that's the standard assumption. So. There was all, all, I really had to kind of full teeth fight to get in there, to get into their belief space. And, and they were fairly open and receptive after a while, but it took a while. With you guys, I, don't, I think, you know, Andrew, everything Andrew said in his talk, it's like, check, 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 you know. I, I'm just, I agree with everything, so that's it, I'm done. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the biopsychosocial or whatever order you want to put it in. The bio part is embedded or you know contextualized within uh, a, a mind, a space, a contextual understanding of. We don't go in and perform lobotomies or do you know neurosurgery in order to help people with addiction, right? So we're not directly in dealing with the brain. Rather, we need to use our understanding of the biology of addiction, the neurobiology of addiction as being uh, something that helps us understand what's going on at the social and personal and psychological level. I think that's where it's going to be valuable. Someday maybe we'll get in there and be able to, you know, I mean someday those two worlds are really going to fuse, but we're certainly not there now and I'm not thinking it's necessarily at all a good idea. And the kind of drugs available for dealing with people in addiction, as you mostly all probably all know, um, are pretty useless when it comes to dealing with addiction. They're not about helping people stop being addicted. They're about helping people uh, substitute opioids, street opioids, for, for pharmaceutical opioids. That's it, right? For methadone and buprenorphine. Um, and, you know, there's, no, there's naloxone and naltrexone and so forth as well. And that's very useful. And we can use Valium to help people get off alcohol, which means basically uh, keep them from, ha from having uh, hor horrible um, seizures for, you know, a week or so. And then that's it. We're done. And then, you know, they might go back to drinking two weeks later. There's no pharmaceutical approach that is in any way useful for helping people stop being addicted. So the medical model kind of hits a wall there. But... There's a lot more to be said about the, 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 uh, the tensions of the field and how, what we can do to, uh, to, to make, make the best of them. First of all, the, the classic brain disease model comes to you for, from NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. NIDA, by the way, funds something like 90% of the addiction research in the world. People who want research dollars for studying addiction are pretty much coerced into saying something that NIDA is going to say, oh yeah, we'd like to fund that, which generally means it's going to, be, it's going to have the word neuro in it and the word bio in it. So, so if you're not doing neurobiological research, you're probably out of luck as far as funding is concerned, and that's a real problem. Okay, so here's the model. Addiction is defined as a chronic relapsing brain disease that is characterized by compulsive drug seeking and use despite harmful consequences, right? Brain imaging studies from drug-addicted individuals show physical changes in areas of the brain that are critical for judgment, decision-making, learning, and memory, and all the good stuff, right? And third, in vulnerable individuals, the disease of addiction is produced by chronic administration of the drugs themselves. And that's important. That's, they really do say that and believe that drugs are the cause of addiction. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to quickly just basically... Uh, uh, dispute every one of those premises. <laughs> okay, premises of the disease model. First, brain change equals brain disease. No, it doesn't. I mean, I'm a developmental psychologist, and we know very well that brains are supposed to change. They change massively from birth to adulthood and through adulthood, and whenever there's learning, the brain changes, and it's supposed to change. The brain is not like the liver or the heart or the lungs that you hope will not change <laughs> through the lifespan. If your brain stops changing, you're in big trouble, so that's just silly. Um, and by the way, you know, nowadays with all the talk about neuroplasticity, it's like not only silly, it's just counterintuitive. Secondly, drugs are what change the brain. Uh, no, they're not what change the brain because we see very similar brain changes. And yes, there are brain changes in addiction, um, for sure. And we see very similar brain changes in behavioral addictions, gambling, porn addiction, sex addiction, gaming addiction, internet addiction, binge eating disorders, obesity. All of these things, we see similar changes. We see um, alterations in prefrontal activity. We see alterations in dopamine uptake, dopamine metabolism, energizing the kind of reward centers, as they're called. I'll talk more about that soon. Um, they look the same. 
as substance addiction. So, you know, it's not about substances. It's about something else. Brain change in addiction. Is it unique? Is it about addiction, a very specific kind of thing that we call addiction? No, it's not, because the kinds of brain changes that we see here are also seen in people who are uh, highly invested in sports, sports fanatics, wealth acquisition, politicians, you know, very, uh, um, shall, we show, shall we say, enthusiastic or ambitious politicians, business people, compulsive shopping, love and sex, that's a big one. There's a lot of research that shows that the dopamine, cha changes in the dopamine system that you see in addiction are very similar to what you see in sex. Uh, bonding, pair bonding, uh, falling in love, romance. And that's the case with humans and it's also the case with prairie voles, which is a little rodent. So, <laughs> you know, so again, it's not just about addiction. It's about something which is highly motivating and repetitive. Okay, which all these things are highly motivating and repetitive and involve a very strong motiv motivational or emotional push forward, thrusting through obstacles in order to uh, acquire rewards. Addiction is chronic? Well, no, it's not, as I think most of you people know, and as the statistics clearly show from NISARC and other kinds of data, databases, that uh, most people recover. Something like 95% of people recover from addictions to all substances by the time they're, well, my age, <laughs> roughly, you know. And, and some of the, the, the contrasting arguments say, oh, yeah, well, they stop for a while, but then they relapse, which implies that they've been, you know, had this thing sort of like a cancer that's, that's uh, still down there, but hasn't yet, re, you know, that's remitted for a while. But no, it's not like that, because uh, it's just not. <laughs> um, because people really do stop with, with there's average times for, for stopping, for quitting. Uh, they've been well studied. For cocaine, the median time, if you start taking cocaine regularly, daily, today, on average, the median, half of you, will stop in within four years, or in four years. And then the tails of the distribution spread on both sides. So some people will stop in two weeks, and some people won't stop for 40 years. But I have a client like that. She's, she's in her late 60s, and she's still snorting coke. But the median is four years. For, uh, for weed, it's about six or seven years. For alcohol, it's 13 years. And for tobacco, that's, that's the bad one, it's uh, 23 years. So that's the median age, right? Again, big individual differences like there is in anything, but especially in, in this uh, very kind of uh, uh, problematic behavior. Most people recover, and most people recover without formal treatment, and a lot of people have written about that. Maya Salovitz is sort of my favorite, and that... She's written a lot of really great articles about, about uh, people quitting and, of course, quitting is one thing and it's not the only thing and it's not the only way to get on top of your addiction, as Andrew pointed out. You know, there's all kinds of gradations in terms of, of overcoming your addiction and controlled use is a big one. And also, there's nothing wrong with taking drugs. It's not evil. You know. <laughs> in fact, in fact, there's like, you know, drugs at the back of the room there that you can, t <laughs> you're free to take. <clears throat> yeah, whatever works, you know, as long as you're not hurting other people uh, and hopefully not damaging yourself too much, uh, then there's nothing evil about it. Most people recover, and it's called spontaneous recovery or maturing out of addiction, and it happens without formal treatment. Fifth premise, addiction destroys the will. I certainly don't think it does, and probably you would agree with me. First of all, it requires <laughs> a lot of will to, to get drugs, uh, especially when they're illegal. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of thinking and a lot of using the prefrontal cortex, which is supposed to be offline. Also, it takes a lot of effort and will to quit. And also, the idea of free will is incredibly complex. So when Nora Volko comes around and says, you know, this is a disease of free will, um, what the hell is she talking about? What does that even mean? Like, you know, what is free will? Like, so much of what we do is habitual and, and, and has to do with what we've... It's a deterministic universe, and free will is a dodgy concept. Let's just leave it at that for now.